Good afternoon, everybody, and may I add my own welcome to our very special 50th anniversary conference here at Belmas. So I'm very, very pleased to be able to bring you my own comments at this point and to introduce our first keynote speaker. And thank you, Victoria, for that kind introduction. I do also want to take the opportunity to say something about the journal Education and Management Administration and Leadership just mentioned by Victoria. Um, the conference is taking place in the very week that the impact factor for the journal, uh, the Society's Academic Journal, email was announced. And for those of you who don't know already, I'm very delighted to announce to you that the impact factor has improved from 2.448, ranked 49th in the education category, to 4.208, ranked 37 in the education category. This is out of 264 journals. And this is an increase of more than 70% in one year. And this gives me the opportunity publicly to thank the Belmas community for their support for the success of the journal. And in particular, all those of you and many others who are authors, reviewers, members of international boards, the emails administrator, Louise, who's worked with me for 17 years on this journal, and our publishing partner, Sage, for this outstanding achievement. So it's now my pleasure uh, to introduce to you our first keynote speaker, Dr. Stephen Courtney. Stephen is currently the research coordinator for the University of Manchester's Institute of Education. He's an editor for the journal Critical Studies in Education. He's co-convener of the Belmas Research Interest Group, Critical Education Policy and Leadership Studies, and an elected member of Belmas Council, um, the governing body for Belmas. Stephen's academic career follows professional roles as a teacher of TESAL in Paris and as a language teacher in London Comprehensive Schools. His research includes projects on multi-academy trusts, on the privatisation of education and policy enactment of internationalisation in higher education. So I'm pleased to say that Stephen brings this extensive successful experience to his keynote presentation today, which has the tantalising title of Conjuring Leadership, Magical Thinking in Education. I'm sure that his presentation will stimulate many questions and comments. Please place these in the chat and the conference team will monitor them for question time that will follow the presentation. I am pleased now to invite Dr. Stephen Courtney to make his keynote presentation. Thank you. Thank you very much, Tony, for that introduction. And thank you also to Belmas for this invitation to deliver the first of two keynotes in this very 50th anniversary year of the Society. In this keynote, I aim to present and elucidate conjuring as a metaphor for a range of processes and conditions in educational leadership. I'm going to argue that conjuring can be seen from the tactics deployed by leaders to the creation of the policy context that necessitates or encourages such activities. In fact, I suggest that the relationship goes even deeper. The vision work constructed as fundamental to educational leadership is a process whereby new realities are conjured and increasingly only the conjurer can do this. Taking on the label of leader conjures new possibilities for agency and limits others. One of the mechanisms whereby a leader may influence followers to think and act in ways that had previously not occurred to them is well known in the magic literature as mind control, but it's really simply a way of structuring agency in a way that is fundamental to leadership, including that of education. Finally, many of the models in use now or formerly in educational leadership have been conjured more through belief than evidence where they attain an ontological status that persists and is structuring. All these points indicate a nature and extent of magical thinking in educational leadership that have profound consequences for the field, some of which 
I will highlight today by way of exemplification. Conjuring came into the language through Old French from Latin, where it meant to constrain by oath or by a sacred invocation. Um, I shan't dwell long on that meaning, but it's clear that what has survived considerable semantic shifts in the word conjuring is the notion of a process that has a strong influence on agency. That which is conjured goes on to structure. Structure is particularly important in educational leadership, which is both obliged and enabled to be practiced, experienced and understood at the intersection of a matrix of factors, imperatives, imaginaries and debates. Educational leadership is never free to manifest simply as practice that is informed only by evidence, but must always be understood and undertaken in full recognition of the ways in which the political is interwoven with the personal and with the professional in order to serve particular interests, objectives, audiences and times. Conjuring is a useful metaphor to help illuminate this. Conjuring invokes the idea of making something new, different or unexpected happen through magical or magical seeming means. There are lots of overlaps with educational leadership here. If followers had been intending to do something anyway, then they wouldn't need leaders or leadership. The new and different in education are what make leadership necessary, or at least are a prerequisite to leadership. But conjuring goes beyond the new initiative that suddenly appears, although there is plenty of that. It can be seen throughout the contemporary education landscape in a range of what we might recognise as parlour and platform tricks. Let me highlight some of these for you now. First of all, the Magical Disappearing Act. Um, there are homologies here with education um, in which school leaders make mostly low attaining students disappear from their role just before they show up in the school's exam performance data. This off rolling has since become apparent in other phases with sixth form institutional practices in particular coming under scrutiny. This concerns instances where students are off rolled at the end of their first year of study if they look as if they're not going to add value in the performance league table stakes when they've completed their second year. The public and media have been decidedly un struck at this disappearing act. Where the conjuring metaphor is perhaps inadequate is in the fact that the disappeared are not smiling collaborators in the trick, but are instead themselves tricked into thinking that their education mattered beyond what can be gained in the high stakes accountability culture that's been engendered in England for the last 30 years. This helps explain but not excuse the practice, which in its grimly shocking display of values last tactical expediency screams managerialism rather than demonstrates leadership. Another ma manifestation of the magical disappearing act is the fiction that academies in England are new schools with no history. The one represented in this screen capture is one such, which in its former incarnation was the secondary school that I attended in Nuneaton in the 1980s. It appears to have apparated in September 2010 and immediately started presenting as underachieving according to the usual metrics. Now, if only we could get a notion of the community and institutional threads that linked the shining new Nuneaton Academy to the former secondary modern, the Alderman Smith School, that shared its space and taught the same children. Most of us only two or three generations removed from coal miners. But no. Officially, that school has disappeared. Indeed, for Ofsted report purposes, it never existed. This has the effect of not only disappearing the school, but also of disappearing the histories and associations with its former pupils. Um, the Older and Smith School's alumni, just from my year group, went on to become, for example, quality director at the, the national chain Busy Bees Nurseries, service manager for acute and forensic adult mental health services at an NHS trust, head of media at Coventry University, and I could go on, um, but all have been disappeared. And so to sum up this slide, this is a particularly total form 
of disappearance. Totalitarian tendencies in education, especially concerning disappearance, have been flagged up in the literature before. As Helen Gunter and I reported in 2015, teachers are particularly susceptible to being disappeared should they not um, contribute sufficiently to the head teacher's or principal's vision, which normally consists fairly predictably in raising attainment in standardised tests and examinations. The lack of contractual oversight from local authorities means that staff in academies are particularly susceptible to these practices. But heads in all sorts of schools said in their interviews with me that they would like to get rid of teachers and they were mostly able to do so without too much trouble. One principal of a selective academy said, it's all about the right type of people. The right people and chucking out what wasn't needed and getting in what was. And in any school, if you ask any head, if they could change 10% of the staff, they could make an impact somewhere. So staff had disappeared through seemingly banal bureaucratic structures, such as restructuring and contract lapse. The break clause at the end of the NQT's induction might be invoked, for example. However, the heads I spoke to were not overly concerned to act under the radar where experienced staff were deemed fit for disappearance. Capability procedures were initiated without hesitation. Um, I want to stress at this point, because it does often come up, um, that I support head teachers' rights to manage their staffing in ways that respond to genuine underperformance. What this article highlights is the extension of those powers into the domain of disagreement or insufficient agreement with the leader's vision. MAT CEOs are experts in escapology, particularly following a poor inspection outcome of the MAT constituent academies. Accountability is always described as being hierarchical, yet more often than not, it's the individual school's principal who gets the chop rather than the CEO in what we might alternatively accord in this slide, the Magical Disappearing Act Part 4. Um, this, of course, is structurally facilitated with MATS themselves not being subject to inspection by Ofsted, the Education Inspectorate in England, only the academies within it. Somewhat inevitably then, there is an evidence gap when it comes to pinpointing the role of the CEO. Ofsted's 2019 report that examined this state of affairs supports this analysis, concluding that there is often limited accountability of the MAT itself. Indeed, MAT leaders seem almost preternaturally able to escape from danger, whether that come from poor Ofsted outcomes in its constituent academies or other risks and misdemeanours. It's illustrative to look at the very worst of them by one metric, reported in The Guardian in 2018 by Richard Adams and Kaylin Barr. Taking student progress between Key Stage 2 and 4, Adams and Barr identify the five worst performers. Escapology is evident throughout their career trajectories post-2018 and the publication of this article. For example, Marion Plant OBE leads the Midland Academies Trust, which has sponsored the Nuneaton Academy that I referred to earlier, right from its 2010 creation. Not only did she escape dismissal following this report in The Guardian, but she was actually awarded the Businesswoman of the Year title by the East Midlands Chamber of Commerce in 2018. And just above that, the uh, second worst, the Wakefield City Academies Trust was wound up just months before that this article was published, owing to alleged financial mismanagement regarding the interim CEO, Mike Ramsey. Reporting in 2016 on a leaked draft DfE report following an investigation into the affair, the Times Educational Supplement reported that the trust had been put in an extremely vulnerable position as a result of inadequate governance, leadership, and overall financial management. Specifically, and amongst other things, the Trust paid its CEO £82,000 for 15 weeks' work. And a further £440,000 went to IT and administrative companies owned either by himself or his daughter. A police investigation came to nothing. 
According to Companies House in 2021, Mr. Ramsey currently holds three active directorships. His self-penned LinkedIn bio describes him as having the ability to deliver outstanding financial and business acumen, consistently demonstrating the ability to interpret financial information and make risk-based decisions. The Quick Change Magic Platform trick is especially beloved of educational leaders at regional schools commissioner and department for education levels. The dazzling but superficial quick change of clothes is intended to signify something more fundamental. Schools become academies, academies get absorbed into multi-academy trusts, and academies are passed back and forth across trusts in a process known as rebrokering and are rebranded. In all cases, the mundane is apparently transformed magically into the new and different before our very eyes, yet with no sign of the nuts and bolts mechanism. We're meant to wonder and marvel, but not ask too many questions. But look closely. In one sense, it's only the clothes that change. The object of transformation, smiling in this gift through gritted teeth, <laughs> is the same magician's assistant. Similarly, the Alderman Smith School in Anita never quite lost that sense of itself as a secondary modern, and the community that it served certainly didn't suddenly change in the magical transformation to academy status. Academization is as much quick fix as quick change, but fixes are harder to realise than that. Yet in another sense, the state country made a more fundamental change. Once privatised, schools are hard to make public again, once lines of accountability are lost, they're hard to reinstate. Once assets have been transferred to private companies and teacher contracts changed for the worse, then unpicking the damage takes serious resources, will and time. So these changes are substantive and make a real difference to teachers and teaching, to leaders and leading, and to notions of education as a public good. However, as Stephen Gorard demonstrates, they are changes that do not, per se, make a positive difference to children and their educational outcomes. In other words, they are the wrong changes. The glittering new gown is threadbare and moth-eaten. Um, mentalism isn't my term, I hope you realise. Um, according to the magic company Vanishing Inc, Mentalism is the art of leveraging a highly developed understanding of human psychology and body language to influence others and provide unexplainable psychological experiences. A mentalism performance often focuses on expanding reality with explorations of psychology, suggestion and influence. And the similarities between certain constructions and mentalist performances are striking and illuminative. Weber brought charisma to the attention of the Academy, arguing for a form of charisma that is extraordinary, almost super. This speaks to mentalism specifically to the intended effect of mentalism in an audience. Landman, for example, writes, magic can function as a significant means to disrupt and subvert an audience's sense of reality. And in some cases, their fundamental set of beliefs about how the world works, as well as deeper religious and metaphysical concerns. This profound subversion brings to mind Alex's 2000 critique of transformational leadership in which he raised concerns regarding the right of transformational leaders to interfere in followers' subjectivities in this way, and also regarding the potential for such interventions to resemble domination rather than educational leadership. The psychology and organisation studies informed literature from the 1970s onwards rejected the Weberian construct of charisma, privileging instead a conceptualization of charisma that foregrounded individuals' behaviours and traits. From this field, we get the notion of charisma as learnable, just as is the case with mentalism. 
Its effects can be startling, but the techniques used to achieve them are reasonably mundane. This learnability was one of a number of products of the psychologization of charisma, which according to Callas, provided the required conceptual justification for maintaining the conventional, conventional notions of management based on bureaucratic authority as the only legitimate form of organizational leadership, despite claims to the contrary. Charisma's field shift from sociology to psychology simultaneously individualized and demystified it, making it acquirable and providing the intellectual warrant for a burgeoning leadership industry, where suppliers promise to enhance the customer's charisma on a consultancy or other transactional basis. This is the third way in which charismatic leadership speaks to mentalism. Despite the magical framing, learning mentalism is commodified and the mentalist is for hire. Conjuring is not only something that school leaders are genetically engage in, it's also the sanctioned policy mechanism, particularly but not solely during the pandemic. At various points, head teachers in England have been expected to conjure from thin air the resources and expertise to enable first, learning from home without the promised technical support, second, testing capacity, and third, teaching in person whilst managing bubbles and periods of quarantine. We see on this slide the cri de coeur of a primary head teacher who's trying to reinstall the humanity back into a pedagogy that had literally been rendered remote. Just as the head teachers and school staff were being required to conjure the necessary resources to realise learning from home, so too were parents and the children themselves. Laptops promised by the state turned out to be an illusion, an extremely large scale magic trick. Subverting expectations is a central feature of magic and conjuring, and it transpires that head teachers were actually expecting laptops to be provided. Well, shablam, they weren't. What a twist. Just before Christmas 2020, secondary school leaders learned that they were expected to arrange regular testing in schools. This exemplifies the dark side of a long-standing discourse of school leader autonomy, according to which heads and principals are best placed to know how to arrange education within their school. School autonomy's function as discursive legitimation for depoliticization is clear here. However, the state does not have the organizational experience and will to marshal its resources and planning capacity for the public good, and has delegated thinking and responsibility to these parastatal actors. There's nothing in the head teacher standards to prepare a school leader for this requirement. I accept that a pandemic does not constitute standard times. And the fact that many states predicate their understanding of school leadership on a set of standards tells us something about policymakers own understanding of the role and their attitudes towards risk. England experiencing a third wave of COVID-19 based on the spread of the Delta variant. The requirement to quarantine entire bubbles when a is suspected means that there have been soaring rates of school absence. And there are recent hints that this policy will be re-examined for September, but what's notable is the reactivity. The head teachers try to make it work through conjuring ad hoc solutions and the state only steps in to avert a full scale national scandal when events outrun the provisions. Or, as we saw in the case of exams, it doesn't. I'm locating my analysis in England, but head teachers across the world are expected to magic resources out of thin air. I'm currently analysing data from a research project exploring education privatisation in the Caribbean. The joint principal investigator is Dr. Renal Lee Piggott of the University of the West Indies, well known to Belmas. We've interviewed, interviewed a range of education actors, including from the regional organisation CARICOM, from teacher unions and from schools. This quote is from a head teacher in a secondary school in Barbados. She said, the government provides what they call a grant, 
which must last through the whole school year. But it's never enough. So therefore, you have to be willing to ask private sector entities for sponsorship. So shortage is everywhere, but it's not a neutral phenomenon. So conjuring is the mechanism by which school leaders are expected to respond to an enduringly challenging COVID situation rendered impossible by policymakers. They're required to produce something from nothing. However, it goes further than that. The preceding quote from Barbados illuminates a structural consequence of demanding that head teachers conjure in response, not just to exceptional circumstances, but to shortage more generally. They are, they are obliged to use the options available to them, both materially and discursively, which today includes the private sector. So conjuring is intimately connected to a range of privatization agendas and dispositions, since the nothing that precedes and necessitates the act of conjuring is a purposive and well-known stage in the privatization playbook. Shortage is a political choice. Governments defund public services so that their ensuing poor quality justifies private sector involvement. The context for conjuring in educational leadership extends into government too. The UK's current batch of Westminster policymakers see it as a central governance task to conjure an imaginary, a state of unreality that must be treated as real and that constitutes the point of departure for a host of policies. Let's think of it as the policy equivalent of the straw man. We saw it strongly in the Brexit debates where the UK was reconfigured as England and conjured into existence as simultaneously highly vulnerable, for example, to immigration from Turkey and Syria, and bullishly strong, for example, through being in a position to influence global agendas alone once free of the shackles of EU membership. The country in chief, Boris Johnson, has been explicit about how he sees this approach as central to his mode of governing. In a profile for McTague of the Atlantic, it was revealed that Johnson's mission is to restore Britain's faith in itself, to battle the effete and desiccated and hopeless defeatism that defines the Britain of his childhood. He believes that if you repeat that it is mourning in Britain over and over again, the country will believe it and then it will come to pass. Johnson understands the art of politics better than his critics and rivals do. He is right that his is a battle to write the national story and that this requires offering people hope and agency, a sense of optimism and pride in place. He has shown that he is a master of finding the story voters want to hear. People live by narrative, said Johnson. Human beings are creatures of the imagination. This, of course, is right. Paul Mason has offered a similar analysis from a left-wing perspective concerning why the left has not succeeded over the last 11 years. It's lacked a convincing narrative that helps the UK to visualize itself and its future positively, a narrative that is obviously and explicitly held together and achieved through a coherent suite of left-wing policies. Now, I raise the issue of Boris Johnson's disposition to governance because he sets the tone for what is politically possible or sanctioned throughout government, including in the Department for Education. Gavin Williamson has adopted the spirit of Johnson's approach, but without the narrative glue that holds it together. In other words, he seems able to invent items, but not link them into a narrative whose lack of attachment to reality is forgivable because the story it tells is so powerful. What we get from him, in my view, are random, unconnected misrepresentations of reality that speak to immediate political pressures and imperatives, rather than to an overarching strategy for what he thinks education in this country should look like. I'm not making a party political point here. I don't think anyone other than David Blunkett and Michael Gove have articulated and tried to enact such a strategy for education in the last 25 years. In order to function politically, an imaginary has to conjure as whole a world as possible. 
Note that I say conjure rather than constitute. Brexit happened because the slogan take back control conjured a world of sovereignty without being concerned with the details. Just as with conjuring, the audience's imagination supply the rest. Conjuring is about giving just enough for this to happen, for audiences to want to invest in making it happen, to want to put in this effort themselves, much like leadership. Conjuring an imaginary is not just a mode of state governance. It is discursively fundamental to all contemporaneously privileged forms of educational leadership, including in schools. Vision work is conjurative, for instance. An ideal and compelling future is summoned and articulated by the leader. Followers' responsibility is then to enact it. However, for about as long as visions have been discursively compulsory in educational leadership, that is from around the time of the explosion in popularity of transformational leadership, there have been critiques concerning the gap between claims and reality concerning visions and vision work. Specifically, how can possession of and superior ability to articulate a unique vision underpin leadership legitimacy when visions are demonstrably only ever variations on a theme. That theme is the standards agenda, which is imposed by the state through performative and high stakes accountability regimes. This was pointed out by Nigel Wright in 2001, when he asked about the extent to which head teachers and their staff have space and inclination to exercise genuine agency. So the vision is essentially extrinsically derived but performed as if it were individually generated by the leader and context specific. To explain this dissonance, I make the following argument. The field has been focused on the vision as product, whereas I argue that we need to look more closely at the vision as process, that is conjuring a new reality. This is why few seem to articulate that they have noticed or mind that visions end up looking very similar. It's not actually the vision that counts, it's the visioning. This is a magical process through which leaders reveal themselves as such. This, why, this is why the English language foregrounds conjuring and conjurers, not that which is conjured. It's hard to render it succinctly in English, isn't it, from that main verb to conjure. In a similar way to the language, the field privileges vision work, that is to say, process, and vision workers, i.e. producers, who are constructed as educational leaders. The actual vision is invoked, but rarely stands up to scrutiny as a distinctive and obviously superior creation to anything that anyone else in the school might have come up with. Helen Gunter and I took Wright's argument further by insisting that mundanely similar standards agenda derived visions are to be treated as if they are special and singular. There is, I suggest, an element of mentalism to this process. Followers are to be convinced that things are other than they appear. There's certainly no magic involved or the results would not be so banal as to require compelled awe, an orthodoxically homogenous interpretation that's simultaneously far out of sync with observable reality. If it were to be admitted that the vision is not special, then it follows that the producer of that vision loses his or her legitimacy to lead. Other, likely more substantial reasons why leaders become appointed are sidelined. The metaphor of conjuring has helped me see past the assertion that visions are significant as products. I have then been able to examine what work visioning as process is doing in leadership. So I've gone back for this keynote through some of the data extracts in the Get Off My Bus article that um, I wrote with Helen Gunter to think about this um, again. And I can see now that vision work may act as a proxy for other features of educational leadership that are less sayable for instance, for decisiveness, um, 
Phil said, I think whatever happens, you're king in your own school, aren't you? And there's no one more able to take decisions than the monarch. He went on to say, I think as heads, we're all a bit megalomaniac. Um, for me now, looking at this data again, it looks as if that is speaking to the notion of just being comfortable about being in charge, um, being at ease in the top spot. For ambition, Paul in um, another school said, I'm no longer satisfied with having an impact in this community. For single-mindedness, Rod said, if I believe something's right, I do it. For stubbornness, there's also a large streak of this. I'm never wrong. <laughs> Even for arrogance, um, the founders appointed me because when I interviewed, I was the one that probably was able to vocalize things that they couldn't vocalize, but knew they wanted. Um, I mean, Paul can read minds. And finally, for ruthlessness, this is how it's gonna be. You're either on the bus or you're off the bus from Jane. And so it seems to me now that couching so much leaderful practice and so many leadership dispositions as vision work simplifies and sanitizes educational leadership. It also makes it easier to commodify and repackage it in leadership development programs. It's easier to construct a learning outcome centered on vision than to raise explicitly the reported contemporary advantage in being, for example, ambitious, stubborn and ruthless. Lots of different structures to enable the reality conjuring that I've discussed are possible. But the field of magic, like so many fields, seems to have privileged the lone male figure of the heroic conjurer as paramount. The magician's assistant is nearly always female and rarely agentic. When women do magic themselves, it's seen as dangerous and contrary to nature. We rarely see women doing conjuring. The equivalent is probably something more like witchcraft. Um, Hans Baldung Grien created the woodcut on the right called Witch's Sabbath in 1510. I mean, even though it's not intended to be complementary, we can still see some distinctive features coming through of this as an alternative form of magic making. It's communal. There seems to be some point to it beyond the trick itself. And women are centered as protagonists rather than being assistants or the objects of the conjuring trick. The central idea that women have agency and are powerful has been pulled through into modern representations of witches and witchcraft. As this gift from American horror story Coven demonstrates, modern depictions show witches as advantaged and empowered through their collaboration with one another. How does this help explain women in educational leadership? I suggest that like conjuring, the default in educational leadership is masculinized. This happens in lots of ways that are often implicit. For example, when we read about the importance of charisma to educational leadership, as we do in a recent how-to guide to school leadership by Povey and McInerney, it is unsaid but obvious that charisma resides in an individual. Individualizing is often an indicator of masculinizing because of its links with heroic leaders and leadership. I'm definitely not saying that all male leaders would rather act alone and women would rather collaborate. To observe that educational leadership is masculinized is to interpret at the discursive level rather than to predict individuals' practice. To be clear, the conjurer's costume is just as costumey for the men as for the women. It's just that the fit happens to suit men's proportions better. Conjuring happens outside vision work in educational leadership in a range of ways. One is the way in which the very identity of the leader is conjured through the mere invocation or use of that label leader. We might say that the leader is a character whose pre-established dispositions inform the role. Alistair McIntyre in 1983 introduced the notion of the character into philosophy from theatrical traditions in Japanese no and English medieval morality plays. There, stock characters like the devil had characteristics that were already known to the audience, 
which helps move the action along, enable its interpretation and underpin the moral message. McIntyre argued that using the label leader works in the same way. It conjures a specific character which enables and structures particular forms of agency and dispositions, as well as how they're perceived by followers. When someone is appointed as an educational leader, they're both empowered and limited by people's pre-existing understanding of what that means, which McIntyre suggests may have many shared features across a discursive landscape. This is known in the field of practice. Norwood, cited in Grace, um, revealed the power of the label head teacher in 1909, a power that exceeds and arguably contributes to the authority of the actual person in the role. So Norwood wrote, the headmaster is an autocrat of autocrats and the very mention of the title conjures up in the minds of most people, a figure before which they trembled in their youth. So the educational leader is conjured through accepting the label leader. This is why labels and job titles matter. When we call the person in charge of a mat, the CEO, we are invoking a character located in business and according the role incumbent, the agency and means to act as such. Our expectations are altered to fit the character. This notion of the conjured leader has been fruitful in new conceptualizations of educational leader identities. In 2020, Ruth McGinnity and I used McIntyre's insight as a foundation of our new typology. We interplayed the idea of the character with Anne Cunliffe's notion of leader reflexivity in order to answer the question, what sort of leader identity would be produced if he or she didn't really think about the limitations of the conjured character and simply attempted to conform to expectations? And what if, on the other hand, he or she not only engaged with it, but sought to transform the character for future generations to draw on as an identity resource, to conjure a new identity through practice. This sort of thinking about educational leadership is itself conjurative. All typologies bring into existence categories that do not exist in precisely that form in real life. But that which is conjured can itself conjure. In other words, the categorizations can be taken up in the field of practice and research and become meaningful there, not just as models for research, but as core elements of professionals' identities. We've all read about educational leaders who describe themselves in ways that conform to definitions of transformational, distributed or system leadership, even if they don't use those exact words. They've internalized the discourse, which is what happens with discourses. They become identity forming. However, those discourses were conjured to create order in an inevitably messy domain of social practice, that is educational leadership. They took hold because they helped achieve a political agenda. So transformational leadership might have started as a suite of empirical findings based on survey data from a range of fields, but it was taken up by the state as a tool to enable public services reform. And by many of practice and research in order to gain status through performing or promoting the privileged identity. So teacher leaders, system leaders, distributed leaders, all were either conjured through nominative pre-configuration or described empirically and practices, as well as informed new education policies. Models and thereby new realities have been conjured through academic and policy work upon which they become reified, attaining an ontological status that has outpaced the evidence and not kept up with societal shifts. Transformational, distributed and system leadership, for instance, do not speak to urgent societal demands concerning, for example, a requirement to look at the interplay between educational leadership and race or educational leadership and gender. The nuts and bolts mechanisms underpinning that mysterious process or relation that we know as leadership draw on practices that structure, or in other words, that limit agency. A similar suite of processes is recognisable in the magic literature. 
Magicians in the field call it mind control, but Pyles and Kuhn argue that it's really facility with the psychological processes that underpin decision making. They go on to argue the following. We like to think that we are in charge of our decisions, but psychological research shows that many of our behaviours are unconsciously influenced by external stimuli and that we are often oblivious to the cognitive mechanisms that underpin the choices we make. Magicians have exploited this illusory sense of agency for a long time, and they have developed a wide range of techniques to influence and control their spectators' choice of things such as cards, words, or numbers. These techniques are called forces. I'm not suggesting that leadership is reducible to sleight of hand, of course. However, the point of leadership is to structure others' agency, and educational leadership is to do so with an educative purpose in mind. Thinking this process through with the metaphor of conjuring illuminates the weakening of an art form in education. Compared to conjurers, educational leaders are not obliged to leave subjects unaware of the forces at work. They can simply mandate in order to structure agency. This is one outcome of the present era of strong leadership, where strength is often measured in tears in the staff room toilets. Um, I don't want to overstate this though, um, a weakened art form is not the same one as one that's disappeared. Um, let me exemplify that with these data which come from a research project into multi-academisation and its leadership that I conducted with Ruth McGinnity of UCL. This response to Ruth's question came from someone we're calling Nicola, a member of the senior leadership team of a school deemed failing that had been newly sponsored by the MAT that we were investigating. The MAT CEO, David, put into place not a single head teacher for the newly acquired academy, but a headship team comprising a number of trusted colleagues from the MAT's main hub school. What this extract reveals is the extraordinary degree of control that David has achieved over the headship team. So Ruth asked, do you feel that David's having to split his time between two sites? Is that better than what's happened before? And Nicola responded, well, because it's kind of irrelevant because we've got the headship team and David said, you talk to one of these guys and it's the same as talking to me. So it doesn't matter if he's there in person, if you're talking to Sarah or Kevin or Neil, whoever, you're as good as talking to David. I'm not arguing that this is in any way sinister. It's simply extraordinary. It implies a backstory of enduring agency shaping, such that speaking to any of the headship team is the same as speaking to David himself. It's not that David claims this, which is striking, that would be unsurprising. It's the fact that Nicola confirms that this is the case in practice. Ruth and I and she openly enthusiastic about David's leadership, her own role, and the function of the diplomat. This was not the agency shaping by mandate I talked about earlier, but rather through those magical seeming forces in the educational leader's repertoire, persuasion, charisma, and followers' acknowledgement of legitimate authority grounded in expertise and experience. In conclusion, conjuring, I suggest, is a useful metaphor to think with in regards to educational leadership. It's done by policymakers and is presented as a policy solution, but it's also one of the techniques available to school and other institutional leaders. Importantly, it can be used to summon an imaginary which in education has been called a vision. Thinking with McIntyre, the very construct of leader is conjured and then does discursive work that may complement the skills and dispositions of the incumbent role holder. Conjuring isn't miracle working though. The leader character cannot make up for fatal deficiencies in a particular embodiment and enactment. Conjuring draws a common thread across many mundane practices in educational leadership, as well as many features in educational leadership and of the policy landscape. These include how students, teachers, head teachers, and schools are made to disappear, yet MAT CEOs are able to escape with a flourish and a paycheck. Education institutions may quickly change before our eyes. Indeed, before our eyes explains well how accountability is intended to function in the mattified field of provision. With the exception of mind control, conjuring happens only with the consent and sometimes participation of the audience or follower who importantly does not want to or feel empowered to pick up the top hat him or herself to summon the rabbit. It's the conjurers who conjure. There are implications here for conceptualising distributed and teacher leadership. 
Some have wondered what's in it for teachers to take on tasks with little agency to shape the agenda just in return for the label leader. Thinking with conjuring enables a different perspective. Receiving that label of leader conjures a new identity that is itself empowering, even if the tasks associated with it are not. Arguably, that's one of the main reasons why senior managers in schools were transformed by new labour into senior leaders in the first place. Thank you very much for listening. And I understand that the floor is now open to questions. Thank you very much, Steve, for a most stimulating presentation. It's led me to think of several issues for questions, but we also have a, a number of questions and comments on the chat, so I'm going to uh, defer to them. And um, Rosemary Hoyle, I can see your question. Would you like to um, speak on that and give Steve the opportunity to reply, please? I'm not sure she has the right to speak. Um... In the, yeah, I think I have to read it out. Okay. Right, thank you for correcting me. So I don't know, Steve, whether you can see this, but it's uh, the chat. English school leaders are required to work with governors who hold them to account on behalf of the community and stakeholders. This requires relationships based on trust and transparency, not magic tricks. What are your thoughts on the conjuring leader and the relationship with good governance? Mm, what a super question. Well, I mean, I didn't say that Conjuring covered every single aspect and every relationship um, and every interaction and every social relation. Um, that would be um, pushing the metaphor into conceit. I think that Conjuring describes best what happens um, in the presentation of the school as a performance, especially at times of particular um, stress. So, for example, in Ofsted inspections, which you could describe as one big platform conjuring trick. Um, I would say that it's different forms of conjuring that underpin relationships with governors. Um, that would go back to what I talked about with the leader character. The head teacher or principal inhabits the character that is conjured through the title leader and may draw upon the resources that the character gives in order to have um, social professional relations with the governor. So um, the conjuring happens at one step back from what I'm talking, well, from what I presume you're referring to there, which is like the conjuring is some sort of um, magical thing happening to deceive in that moment. I don't mean it that way at all. Um, in this instance, I um, think that it's the, the pre-conjured identity of the leader which is brought to bear on all professional relationships, including that with the governors. Thank you, Stephen. We have another question now from Diane Gomery. Senior leadership teams are invariably receiving their training in-house and moving up the leadership ladder within and across a group of schools. Can this result in generating or conjuring a form of in-house agency? Um, how interesting, Diane, thank you. I suspect that yes, it can. If we think to the mind control um, analogy, analogy is pushing it, um, that depends on controlling the stimuli and the um, the variables and so if you bring everything in house then it's one huge and hugely important way to control the variables it's much easier to encourage um, the sort of buy into a particular version of reality that underpins mentalism and mind control if everyone um, is exposed to the same stimuli that is controlled all of which are controllable by by the leader, so um, the, here the Matt CEO. So yeah, that that was the uh, slightly longer answer, but the short answer is yeah, definitely. Okay, thank you, Steve. We've got lots of comments. I'm going to try and draw some points from these. Um, there's been quite a lot of comments, Steve, about the impact on the community of the disappearing school, um, which you were referring to in the early part of your presentation. So mm. I just want about 
this issue about history re-emerging as an academy and one uh, commentator talks about that being significant for governance and another one is talking about um, the need to establish trust um, rather than simply working through the disappearing act just wonder if you've got any thoughts on either of those uh, perspectives steve um thank you yeah really important points um the it, it's no mistake that the school that i just picked out because i went to it um i keep an eye on it over the years obviously but it's it's fairly typical it immediately started um presenting again as failing and that was because the um the solutions that were being offered were from the mattification um, playbook rather than thinking about what is this school why is it here who are the children who come here what are the communities like of the children who come here um, and how can we think about education in relation to their needs but also enable them to have any future that they want. I, I gave a couple of tiny examples of people from, from that school who did really well. Um, and it was always vaguely to the surprise of, of the, uh, the people who worked there. Um, mattification is not going to work until schools um, re-engage with the communities um, around them rather than with the abstract notion of what mattification is. So I agree with you entirely. Thank you, Stephen. I, I've got a, a comment here from somebody who broadens the discussion a little bit. This isn't it Al, Al Hodge Simon, apologies for my pronunciation, uh, who says it's a very powerful analysis and argues that the same narrative applies to British schools overseas. Just wonder, Stephen, whether you've got any thoughts on on that, whether the narrative does apply in the way that Nidal seems to think. Um, well, and I've tried to keep my analytical focus on um, the domains that I know something about. Um, and so I've been doing some research with um, Renal Lee Piggott on the Caribbean, and so I can speak to that. Others, and I would be more hesitant about speaking about just because I wouldn't know so much. Um, stay within your area of expertise is, is a wise bit of advice to me. So I suspect that it would be something to investigate. It could be a working hunch um, and I certainly see no initial reason to make me think that it wouldn't be like that. But it's a focus for empirical investigation. Um, it's not a, a presumption that I would make. Thank you, Stephen. But that, that leads me on to a point of my own, if I may, that you referred early on in your presentation to the, the impact of the high stakes accountability culture. Um, and this, this, of course, has got global resonance and we know about that pressure in lots of parts around the world. I just wonder to what extent do you regard that culture as inevitable and indeed underpinned by international agencies such as OECD with its program for international student assessment to which politicians appear to give a great deal of attention so I just wonder whether you you feel it it's inevitable or a direction that we're not going to be able to change um thank you Tony that's a, a really interesting question it's not inevitable I mean I, I recently wrote an article with Dr Brian Mann um, at the University of Kansas um, thinking about the grammar of schooling and we, we looked at some of these really persistent features of, of schooling and thought again about why they persisted and what has made things change in the past, because things do change. It's not right to say that nothing ever changes or that this is common hardcore. And um, briefly what we concluded was that it was big societal stroke macroeconomic shifts that changed and constituted changes in the grammar of schooling. So at the moment, we are in a big neoliberal stroke neoconservative um, era. And so practices in schooling that are congruent with that, or at least don't contradict it, will continue. It's as simple as that. Um, and so they won't change um, until that paradigm shifts. 
Now, it sounds a bit monolithic, doesn't it? Say, oh, crikey, let's let's end neoliberalism. I mean, it will end. Actually, you know, we've, we've we've looked at this in the past. It it will end, and it may actually be one or two events or even people that trigger it finally to end. And so, human individual agency is always important, but certainly. Um, will require state support, even if it's individuals acting for it to take effect. Thank you, Stephen. We've got time for just two more questions that have appeared on the um, chat. So I'm going to just introduce those. So the first one is from the Belmas Vice Chair, Deb Althwaite. Uh, hi, Deb. Um, so she raises the issue about governance role versus the trustee role and questions whether we've lost a further layer of de democratic accountability through school trusts. And that ends up by saying, are we promoting trust leaders to become magicians who can cure all evil? So there's a question for you. <laughs> um, thanks, Deb. Um, again, short answer, yes. Um, a great deal has been lost in terms of the structures um, new roles have been introduced, such as regional schools commissioners, that um, are outside of the accountability structures that um, are public and democratic um, and publicly accountable in that way. And I really like your idea of the trust leaders being, their role being conceived as magicians. Um, that would definitely is going to be on the next slide in future iterations, yeah. Thank you, Steve. So one final question. I'd like to welcome to the conference Ken Bryan from Canada. And thank you, Ken, for your role on the International Editorial Board of Email. And Ken's question is, how self-aware are leaders that they are playing the role as leader? It's a good question to finish on, I think, Stephen. It is, isn't it? Um, thank you, Ken. Well, in the... Um, typology that I showed earlier in the slides for, um, that Ruth McGinnity and I came up with, we took it as a starting point conceptually that not all leaders would be aware. <laughs> um, there, there is, they've got a separate column <laughs> um, or row, I can't remember which. Um, some leaders will definitely not be aware that what they are doing is simply from the playbook and when they um, articulate what they do as being about having a strong vision and, and so on, um, if they do that uncritically, then no, they, they are probably not aware. Others, others will be. And so the amount of reflexivity, and that's why we needed to use Anne Cunliffe to help us out with that. Um, the amount of reflexivity is a key variable. Absolutely. Some have got more of it than others. Thank you very much, Stephen, for your answers to the questions and for your most stimulating uh, presentation. Um, this is where the, the audience ought to break into loud applause, but I don't think that quite works on this forum. But, but on my behalf, Stephen, on behalf of everybody else, thank you very much. So conference colleagues now, there is a, a five minute break now. And then please at a quarter past two British summer time, will you please move to the first paper session? And I very much hope that you enjoy uh, the rest of the conference. And thank you for joining this keynote. <laughs>